Have you, you done multi-day fast? I've yep. done like a day fast. So is you me do a water fast too? Dude, but can can that like kill you or anything? Yeah, it's supposed to. I mean, it's, it's I I loved it. Um, but now I just do intermittent fasting. Okay, how, how many hours? Video is live. I think I think we can get started. Let's do Let's it. Break it up. We are started. Did you roll the titles? Did, did you uh did did do you do water fast, Dom? Or just food? Define fast? water fast. Like you don't drink water for a period Dude, of time. But you no. die in like three days, I think. No, water no, fast you, is you drink only water. Yeah, yeah, I think it's the opposite, dude. No, yeah. that's not what someone told me like a week ago. They're like, you're talking about wrong, talking people, about... wrong people giving you, feeding you misinformation. Yeah. <laughs> if Somebody it is juice fasting. fast, you only drink juice. If it is water, water fast, you only drink water. But, but wait, so wait, wait. fasting, fasting. Yeah, fasting, That it's already a water fast, right? So it's like, that's, it makes sense. No, because you already... can do other fasts with, with like, because fasting is essentially, you're not taking in calories, right? So okay. you can do other, you can take in, intake other different, you know, ingredients that are... Uh, I thought water was the only thing that didn't have calories. What up, everybody? Hello, yeah, everyone. 15. 15, and we're just, we're kicking things off with the water fast, right? We're just Beat Brain podcast where we talk about crypto. And What's fasting. up, world? Yeah, we're we're decided that we're gonna go health oriented this this talk, right? So uh, no, I uh, no, we were just talking about the, the whole water fast thing. So like, how many hours do you do it per per day, Dominic? Like uh, twenty four hours a day. <laughs> so I fast for sixteen hours, and then I eat in an eight hour window. Sometimes wow. I'll go 18 hours. Sometimes I'll go 20 hours. Um, but generally, at least 16. But you're not looking to lose weight, right? Like you are like maintaining it. It's the same. It allows you to kind of stay lean uh, mm -hmm. and enhance insulin sensitivity, right? The main thing is is being an insulin sensitive mm -hmm. because high insulin is a conducer for tons of different and metabolic yeah. disorders later in life. So if you can reduce that. Uh, Keep your glucose low, keep your insulin low. It's a good thing. I, I've been doing the same thing for like three months. It's pretty cool. Oh, yeah. See, nice. you know, it's and, the and, and, but like, do you think, Dominic, like overall, you eat the same amount of calories or you eat less? I do. Uh, well, I it's not the same amount of calories necessary, it's like the constitution of those calories. So, like, I just eat a little bit more protein in that eight hours. Um, so I focus more on protein and then you know, I still have a lot of fat, but not as much carbs. Hardly any carbs. Yeah. So. You don't eat a donut every now and then. Never. I don't like donuts, but, but on my on my week, on my cheat day, I do have ice cream. Yeah. Cheesecake. Cheesecake. I just don't like donuts. Like some people are like, oh, I, I love donuts. I'm like, it's never been like such. Oh, I need to go have a donut. Like I'd rather waste that. On, I'd rather waste. What about the pasta? Ice cream. Like pasta? You oh yeah, like pasta? Pasta, I love pasta. But I never. I don't have it. Don't know awesome. Mm -hmm. So yes, that's <laughs> that's what's up. That's what's up, uh, Mariana. How's everybody doing? Everybody having? We're doing fantastically. Food? Pretty yeah. good. Soon we're gonna get Dama booster seats, so we can look the same as us. I know. I'm gonna. I actually. I should go get the stool downstairs. Right. <laughs> I should go, just go sit on the stool. <laughs> yeah. No. I just. I wanted to. You know. I wanted to show everybody the entire. You know. Abode here. <laughs> So yes, lots of stuff going on in the crypto space this this week, uh, including I know Mariano Argentina has still got some crazy stuff going. So on there. yes, we we had a, a, a little bit of a of a of a rate hike like we're used to in the United States, but slightly longer bit. and slightly bigger. So we had a, only thirty eight basis points that was the the hike, and the wow. actual the actual rate right now is one hundred and thirty three percent per year, right? But it's actually more if you compound the interest, right? Because those are monthly interest that you compound. It's more than 200%, right? So, you know, the, you know, we all know that if someone says that they can double your money, guaranteed, it's a scam. Well, you can, and it's still a scam. But um, yeah, that's that's what's happening. And it's very unfortunate. Um, now, the, the experts are saying that the sort of like the probabilities of entering hyperinflation are over 90% because is this this is something that they will keep doing every single month up until I don't know explosion or something so 
we were gonna see like like in Germany after the World War where people were playing with bills. That already is happening a little bit here. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's very unfortunate, but yeah, it's it's don't don't complain when the Fed raises interest because you don't know what really bad interests are like. So help me understand something, Mariano. Uh, you said that you guys are potential to enter hyperinflation because my understanding is that you already have already well past hyperinflation. Yeah, where's the line? I was going to ask. So, like hyperinflation is is it's a little bit like what we have, right? But technically, it's like hundreds percent inflation per month for a period of over six months. I think that's actually the like I don't remember exactly what's the definition of it. But um, what I'm trying to say, it's expected that we have like 100% inflation per week or something like that. That's when we will be entering that period. So my understanding of 50% a year, if you're beyond 50% annual inflation, it's hyperinflation. Something like, yeah, well, that, those, those are rookie numbers. Those are rookie yeah, numbers. Yeah, we need to pump awesome. those numbers up. 50%? Man, that's so three months ago. That was, that was like five years ago. <laughs> yeah. So... It's 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 I don't know it's it's gonna be a very fun it's not it's definitely not gonna be fun for ninety nine percent of the population but it's gonna be an experience for me uh, and um, I wanna yeah I wanna see how it feels like already there are plans so credit cards companies you know with so high inflation you pay everything with credit card because you get like thirty days and thirty five days of free financing so oh. some car some card companies they are now actually like starting to do it every two weeks so instead of having like a full month to pay they they cut it every two weeks so when I mean, monthly inflation better. is over 50 percent per month that's when you're officially in hyperinflation good to know good to know um so you have when is your guys upcoming election because i know that the, you had the primary with javier Milei. when is the actual election? next week come on well yes I'm, I'm so excited for Milei to win um but it's still like the problem is not going to disappear because Milei says so right First of all, because he would enter a mandate in December, right? So still, like, there's time for them to keep fucking things up. But, dude, like, so this the interest rates are, like, four times whatever the money in circulation is right now, right? So the, the bonds are four times the value of cash, uh, the amount of cash. So if you pay that, you are, like, quadruplicating the money in circulation, and that will create, like, thousands of percent of inflation. And um, yeah, the, the the intention of Millet is to adopt the U.S. dollar, which is very it's still very complicated. Like you still need to have like a huge amount of dollars, and you need to decide on a on a value, which is like still not fully agreed on how he's gonna do it, right? Because you need to have a price to see if you want to dollarize an economy. At what price? At what value will you be doing that, right? Um, but I will keep the Big Brain podcast. Um, especially informed about these current scenarios and when i'm when the time when the time comes that if you want to buy a bottle of water you need to have like one kilogram of bills i will probably record that and show it with the community uh, <laughs> i think you should you, you should uh, do kind of what Tucker. You, you guys never saw like the pictures of germany after the first world war when they essentially defaulted and they had to print a lot of money that people were like carrying sacks of bills in like wheelchairs and things like that well there was a there's a famous story of a lady in a bread line with like a wheelbarrow of marks right was the, the currency back in those days <laughs> and she had to go like take a pee or something or whatever and she she walks away from all of her money the wheelbarrow full of money and then she comes back to find that the wheelbarrow was gone but all the money had been dumped on the ground the wheelbarrow was worth more than all the money. <laughs> so you know that's those that's endemic of of hyperinflation, right? It's like <laughs> actual physical items contain value, not not the actual money that's used to to transact the currency. So wild times you're in, brother. Wild times you're in. So yes, yeah. please please uh, please report back to us when if and when you guys cross that Rubicon. At the Bitcoin conference a couple of years ago, Dominic, I think um, um, there was uh, a huge container uh, ship of uh, Venezuelan uh, uh, dollar, I think. W what is the Venezuelan Bolivar. currency? Uh, pesos. I think yeah, pesos. Pesos. Bolivar, Bolivar, yes. Yeah, so the Venezuelan uh, 
um, base, they had like a huge Bolivar, shipping yeah. container and it was just flying around and uh, just a reminder that you know you you cannot have a very uh, strong currency if people are going to be inflating it more recent for bitcoin hmm. wow absolutely wild yeah. stuff well, well thanks for reporting on that um you know and, and bringing that to our to our listeners attention our viewers attention mariano uh the next topic that we have is is obviously related to not obviously necessarily but it's it's related to a recent article that is suggesting that there's been crypto has been used for funding um hamas uh, according to the CNN article, they're opportunistic and adaptive how Hamas is using cryptocurrency to raise funds. Uh, so it looks like uh, Iran has loomed large as one of Hamas' most general financial backers, providing the militant group crucial resources it needs to carry out acts of terrorism. But investigators in the U.S. and across the globe have identified another revenue source being exploited by Hamas, far-flung online donors offering support in crypto. Uh, even before Hamas launched a surprise attack on Israel over the weekend, Justice Department officials in uh, Washington, D.C. had been pursuing a criminal investigation into the militant group's use of crypto through alleged money launderers, CNN has learned. Well, I mean, I, I guess I'm, I'm not surprised, but, you know, if we want to really have an argument about this, I think that uh, the U.S. dollar has been used for far more, <laughs> far more funding of terrorists or, or I should say, uh, used what's the word uh has has been uh used inappropriately far more than crypto has but it looks like this is going to be a, a good reason for senator warren to to really uh bring the golden hammer on crypto what do you guys think so the the way that they have been fundraising they've been doing the fundraising from 2021 or so for the last two years and uh, they have raised anywhere estimate from 41 to 90 some odd million dollars and using crypto for illegal activities is a bad thing to do please criminals keep using crypto for uh, <laughs> for uh, all illegal activities so the government can easily trace you if it is a bank account then the transaction between bank accounts is very hard to track whereas crypto even years later right there is uh, you know five years later ten years later we would have the technology, even if you don't have the technology now, uh, we will have the technology to be able to track all these illegal uh, transactions. So it's a wrong narrative that crypto is anonymous. It's not anonymous, it's pseudonymous. And there are plenty of tools that the government has at their disposal that can track who's doing a particular transaction. I mean, DJ, there's entire entities inside the crypto space, mm -hmm. right? Like chain mining yeah. and some of these auditing firms, and this is exactly what they do. Right. So exactly. if you're trying to be sneaky, if you're trying if you're trying to be sneaky and you're a terrorist organization raising funds, you're gonna do it through crypto. Uh you're you're more likely just putting not more likely, you are putting a spotlight on yourself. You know, to my yeah. point earlier, you might as well just use a physical physical currency that's not trackable or traceable. Uh so yeah, I mean the yeah. fact that they're the fact that they are but I, I think what this is going to do, however, over overarchingly, is it gives now us-based politicians that are anti-crypto more of a reason to say oh hey look at this i'm right and this is why we need to go and right over regulate and get rid of crypto right i do think uh, that the, um sorry i didn't mean to interrupt no go for it oh, I, I do think that like the narrative of bitcoin being used to like bad things you know like they already had it so if we remember the silk road um the silk road was the largest drug exchange in the world and you can only pay with bitcoin right and in fact like when the silk road when the silk road shut down well they shut it down there was like the biggest amount of bitcoin confiscated in in, in history I, I think like even more than mt Gox at that time and and still right like the, the 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 narrative was the same like bitcoin was a bad thing they got used for bad people to buy to do bad things right so just buying drugs and um so yeah i think that the, the, it's not a new thing in a way right and i do agree with you dominic and bj that the, the most used tool to do bad things is the american us dollar that is used by not only by terrorists but by drug dealers and by politicians that do bad things that do bad businesses so yeah 
Anybody else on this? I'm going to play devil's advocate and say you should use crypto for crime. No, I don't know. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, use crypto totally for crime and get caught. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah, no, uh, yeah, I don't have much to say. Play stupid games, win stupid prizes. Yeah, I'm basically. Like, all right, let's, let, let's encourage more of these terrorist organizations to use crypto. I think that's... <laughs> Let's, all right, let's we'll shine the light on you. All right, next topic, guys, is uh, actually related to the SPF trial. So, crypto lender BlockFi. So, I think we're in what day three or four or five or six of day four, I think. Yeah, day four. Mario, thank you for that. So, crypto lender BlockFi believed Alameda was insolvent given balance sheet it was shown. <laughs> uh, well, after Caroline's testimony, I can see why you might think that BlockFi lost a little over a billion dollars. Like just a little, little over billion dollars, just a, just a few billion among friends due to its involvement with FTX and Alameda Research. Zach Prince, I think, is the founder and CEO of BlockFi. There it is. BlockFi CEO Zach Prince resumed his testimony against former counterparty SBF on Friday, detailing to the court how his lending firm was forced to declare bankruptcy because of its involvement in FTX and Alameda. BlockFi started lending money to Alameda around the end of 2020, or early 2021. And what he recalled were very robust loan agreements. After an initial round of loans, Alameda requested more money from the lender in the second quarter of 21, after which BlockFi let the hedge fund borrow significantly more money following a conversation with Bank and Freed. As of May 2022, BlockFi's loans to Alameda exceeded a billion, Prince said, but BlockFi started asking for the money back because BlockFi had suffered losses from the collapse of Terra Luna. And then Alameda yeah. Research repaid all the money, after which BlockFi made new loans to the company worth $850 million. All right. Well, what say you guys about this new recent uh, uh, <clears throat> news out of the courtroom? What a mess. Who wants to tackle I mean, it? it? It's it's a great drama for Netflix when they do this, this retrial like uh, as a series. I, I guess there were some Thai prostitutes involved too, right? So there's, there's oh yes. Some... So I, I I think <laughs> from the testimony of um of Car what's what's the name of the girlfriend Caroline was, um, yeah. She stated that there were like bribes that they were given to Chinese officials around a hundred million dollars in order to be able to withdraw like a billion dollars that were frozen, and part of that process somehow involved like paying mm. Thailand prostitutes to create like accounts with Binance and be able to withdraw the money through that. Sounds like it's on the up and up. <laughs> <laughs> it's got, what do they say? Sex, money and rock and roll, right? <laughs> yeah. it, it, it has everything except the rock and roll piece. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, yeah, but... I can tell you as a lover of rock and roll, SBF is not my kind. He, yeah. he would be a rock and roll fan, I can tell you that. Yeah, dude. Like, I, I can't imagine for like a person that did like fact so much people. He doesn't look the type. He just looks like like quite bland and like quite pathetic to be fair. Yeah, that's that, that's so. Like, you no, know, pass through so many people's radar. Um, that uh, you know, you, you, you talk to him, you definitely know that he's very smart. And uh, but all the things that were happening in the background, right? The testimonial from Carlin Ellison is. Uh, uh, pretty detailed as to what was happening, and uh, for me, it was I learned a new word, polycule. I've, I've never heard this word before, and uh, they were in a polycule relationship. So there were like ten of them, who were all like living together, working together, and dating. Um, they were in a polyamorous relationship, but they're only kind of committed to the ten people <laughs> that they were living with. <laughs> so. Uh, uh, lots of lots of drama with what's happening with FTX. I mean, I think he pretty much kept the manufacturer of Adderall in business. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will out it, and there must have been like like ships of Adderall being brought into the Bahamas, you know, for those guys. But I mean, I, I think that you know, it was VJ. Michael, we've been in this space for a long, long time. Mariano, we've been in this space for a long time, right? So to have someone like SBF just completely arrive on the scene without really anybody who were OGs in the space knowing 
who he was. And then all of a sudden him having all of this, you know, it, it felt like be, from the first time you heard his name to when he was on the cover of Time Magazine, it was a matter of months, not even yeah. years. Maybe yeah. nine months, maybe a year later, he's on the cover of Time or Wall Street Journal or whatever he was. And you're like, hmm, where did this guy come from? Because most of us who've been in the space since, you know, 2014 or earlier, nobody knew who he was. No, I mean, he wasn't an early adopter. He wasn't an early innovator in this space. And then all of a sudden, he's just got all this money. So immediately, I think some red flags were mm -hmm. thrown around and felt by OGs in this space, myself included. I mean, I did have an FTX account, but I wasn't exactly a big proponent of him. And nor was I of, his, of the SAM tokens, which are now known as scam tokens, which are like, you know, the FTTs and the Sol not well, Solana. He was a pretty big backer of Solana, too, and some of the other uh, tokens. But nevertheless, it's like someone like that that just emerges so quickly. Um, and then, oh, by the way, his political donations started to accelerate just as quickly as his, his persona did. So, yeah, it's just it, it screamed like something's not right here. Um, and then I think the effect of altruism, too, I think that just kind of put it over the edge for me. It's like, oh, I just want to make all this money so I can give it all back to everybody. Yeah, seem really culty, right? Yes. Uh, um, and I guess that's how he kept all the secrets within those 10 people. It's like, Hey, yeah. we're all, we're all dating too. So hush, hush. About to be fair, things. Dominic, what you said, I feel, I felt, and I still feel the same thing as Binance. Yeah. Yeah. No, I can, I, well, at least CZ has been in the space for a while though. Like he's, he's been in the space since, I mean, I remember Binance was one of the first exchanges I ever used back in 2014. Right. Or what was it? 2017. 2017. Yeah, 2014. There was, was no Binance. <laughs> it, there was it was that was MT Gox all that back then. But 2017. I mean, they were. It was what Bitrex and then Binance and then Binance kind of started it. it. I will at least give CZ credit for at least establishing himself back in those days. But I, as far as um, repu reputation, I'm I'm with you. I think that there could be an asterisk there. I mean, I I'm overall generally very suspect of anybody with a with a centralized exchange nowadays <laughs> so I mean, sam, sam came on the scene because uh of that arbitrage uh loophole he was taking advantage of with japan and you know crypto traders love a good arbitrage story and he was arbitraging bitcoin so it's like we accepted him with open arms into the community because of his uh, past with that and you know he got that's how he got all that money right that's how he got started so um yeah i think that's i think that's how he was accepted so quickly and how he rose so quickly. And money talks. If you look at the amount of money that they are throwing around, it is like, oh, 100 million pay bribe to this guy in China. You know, the uh, um, there was another, we lost 200 million. There was an engineer who was uh, discussing about how they lost close to $300 million, all for s like simple, stupid stuff. They were doing some DeFi yield farming and uh, with a chain that was not very well known um and the founder like disappeared with the with the money for some time and they have to pay him to get the money back um they had a, a password with a seed phrase that was stored as a plain text and the plain text was um was then shared and got leaked online and about 50 million was stolen so the very poor lack of security. Yeah, so there was like, uh, his timing was really good. Like everyone was just throwing around money at that time uh, for a couple of years. So it was easy to get get through people's radars as well. I mean, the, 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 to find out, I guess I'm a little bit encouraged now because he was effectively just a big degen, just like the rest of most of the people in the in the crypto space for throughout yeah. those couple of years, right? He just had a much bigger pocketbook and he was actually moving, moving markets uh, with that pocketbook. But I want to say another thing too, because I think that this guy was absolutely psychopathic um, because, and, and psychopathic, but also a master manipulator to be able to like, do what he did with Caroline, with some of his other employees, right? He absolutely master manipulated them. Um, you know, again, the whole the whole polycule thing, the polyamorous thing. It's like, okay, I'm gonna have sex with you, I'm gonna have a relationship with you, so as to kind of 
make sure that I got you right. So that you're not going to roll on me or anything like that, which is exactly what he did with her, you know, um, towards the end. So I just think that, uh, you know, there's going to be a lot of case studies about this guy. Um, there's going to be one hell of a, uh, <laughs> Netflix special. I just hope the, uh, what is his name? Michael Lewis, the guy that wrote the big short, the screenplay for the big short, isn't the one doing it because of the sympathy that he expressed in an article. What was it a couple of weeks ago? He's like, Oh, you know, the FTX had a really good business. You know, I could see how it was a, was a, was a good business, had the bones of a good business or whatever terminology he is. It's like, dude, no, the guy is a psychopath. Like you shouldn't be, you shouldn't be, you know, essentially creating excuses for this guy. Like he was an actual, there was actual uh, honest bone in his body. There wasn't. So I agree. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, it's really uh, one very, very funny. funny. His side. Something's going on there. Yeah. So, so next next story, guys. We have speaking of Solana, actually, Base Network uh, outstrips Solana's TVL as summer lull draws to a close. Uh, so, Coinbase's Layer Two Network Base has surpassed Solana in terms of TVL. Uh, Base's TVL wow. has reached impressive three hundred ninety-seven million since its launch in August. Oh, Base and Solana's TVL three fifty-eight. Over the past month, Base has experienced significant growth with a remarkable 97.2% increase in TVL. That's not bad. Uh, on the other hand, Solana has seen a decline of close to 10% at the same time frame. The bulk majority of Base's TVL comes from two projects. Uh, decentralized exchange Aerodome Finance holds a top spot in TVL, close to just shy of 100 million, while the decentralized social media app Frentech, oh, Frentech, baby, everybody's talking about Frentech, ranks second with a TVL of 36 million. Wow, that's actually pretty interesting that, uh, you know, uh, Solana's falling. Maybe it's the SPF trial. <laughs> Maybe people are like, ah, you know, we want to avoid anything we possibly can that's got uh, any association to SPF. But uh, Definitely. what do you guys say about this? So I'm actually quite surprised. Um, I, I, I didn't know, I didn't knew that, that they, they were able to get so much. Of course, you know, it's, it's boosted a lot because it's, these guys, they're Coinbase, right? And I'm wondering how much of that TVL is actually from Coinbase uh, that they put in. Um, but very, very impressed. I think it's it's a very interesting product. And um, a thousand of, of those dollars are mine. So it's like I'm contributing. <laughs> on on tech or on the decentralized exchange, Mariano? On neither, on, on, the, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the chain. I mean. Mm. Got it. Yeah, do do Friend, uh, Friendtech definitely was all the rage for the last month. Everyone was jumping on that bandwagon. I somehow just didn't. I, I, um, I yes. saw it and, and I chose to ignore it. It's like, I, I don't know, something didn't click with me. Yeah, me too. Yeah, I, I agree. DJ, what do you think? If you look at that overall TVL from, uh, from DeFi Llama, maybe uh, um, you can pull up the DeFi Llama chart. Ethereum is the number one in terms of TVL, obviously, right? It's got roughly about 20 billion. The overall TVL is uh, maybe about 30 billion. It's a long tail. So Ethereum is at about 20 billion. Tron is about like you know 6.5 billion. Don't know how. Um, Binance uh, uh, Smart Chain is about 2.6 billion TVL. And then it drops off from there, right? Arbitrum, Polygon, Optimism. So base is number eight. It's a 300 million. So compared to Ethereum at 20 billion, 300 million is uh, what percentage is that? N not no, less than maybe five percent or so. Um, and uh, yes, you know it it overtook Solana, but then it also overtook, uh, for example, Bitcoin. Right? Bitcoin also has uh, some network where you can do uh, some DeFi applications. Bitcoin TVL is about 175 billion, um, and so the, none of the other chains have actually a really large TVL, um, and the TVL drops off uh, pretty drastically on a logarithmic scale. Um, yeah, so that's what I. Uh, um, that's my take on it. Gotcha. Uh, any anything else on this one on the whole uh, base conversation before we move on, guys? Anything else? No. All right. Well, next topic, a record $307 trillion of global debt 
puts world economy on alert. Oh, that sounds, sounds a little clickbaity. Let's Ooh. check it out. Uh, in the first half of 2023, global debt increased by $10 trillion, reigniting concerns about its impact on the world economy and the potential for a financial crisis. The report disclosed that the overall debt has climbed to an unprecedented $307 trillion, marking a $100 trillion rise over the past decade. Dominance of mature markets and the global debt increase. Countries like the U.S., U.K., Japan, and France were mainly responsible for the rise in debt, go figure, during the first half of the year, contributing over 80% of the increase. On the other hand, developing countries such as China, India, and Brazil recorded the biggest upticks in debt within emerging markets. And just to, just to kind of cover this tweet here, governments are riddled with irreversible debt and global corporations are making billions. What do you think is going to happen? I mean, the thing is, is our entire financial system, I mean, that's why we got into crypto. The, our entire financial system has to continue to expand, right? Like they, they create the principal, but they don't create the print enough for the principal and interest, right, to pay back the debt. So by virtue of that, the debt has to continue to expand. The question is, is who's going to be buying that debt? Right. I think that's the bigger question is, all right, so you the Fed, you print all this money, you create all this money, new liquidity in the market. Right. Now you got all these bonds. But now who's coming to the aid of buying those treasuries? Who's coming to aid of buying those assets? Who's coming to the aid of buying those that debt? And if there are not enough buyers then what the Fed is doing is just continuing to print more money to buy those assets. So it's just like this this hamster wheel, uh, you know, phenomenon. Um, So it's we're going to have numbers get obscenely out of just, you know, trillions become quadrillions, right? Uh, millions become billions, billions become trillions, trillions become quadrillions. It's, it's the, the, the numbers continue to get more and more obscene, but also I think that this is part and parcel of late cycle type stuff, right? You know, Ray Dalio's thesis on, you know, the, the long-term debt cycle, you know, the fourth turning, all these kinds of things are lining up. Um, I don't know if it's, intentional that way or it's just it happens to be the way it's lining up but you're starting to see kind of the cracks of a of a financial system that we've had since 1945. Uh, what do you guys think about this so let's first define what is uh, global debt global debt is the amount that is borrowed by governments businesses and individuals so it combines all of it into total so it includes uh, the debt from government, um, businesses that are borrowing, and also people. If you are buying a home, um, if you are putting things on credit card, it takes into consideration all of it. Um, the uh, uh, during pandemic, I think it was about two hundred and twenty-six uh, trillion or so, and now it is uh, more than three hundred trillion. And when you look at these numbers, it's always good to look at the numbers in the relationship. So, if it is three hundred trillion, what does it mean? If it is you know, 200 trillion, uh, what does it mean? Um, the uh, So just for comparison, the uh, global GDP is roughly, say, around like 700, uh, I'm sorry, 70 to 80 trillion or so. So a debt of 320 trillion is almost, how much is that? Say roughly about 330% of global GDP, right? So imagine if someone is, um, um, you know, earning say 100k and uh, having three times their earning as their debt. That's where we are right now. Um, the uh, the debt to income ratio. This is not income. The GDP. It's uh, uh, not considered income. But the income side of it, you can treat the the uh, uh, global GDP as a proxy. Um, so it's about 300%, which is really high. So what do, what do we take about that? Uh, I mean, you're talking about, so where does that lead us? I should say, BJ, um, you know, as far as, you know, 300% seems extremely unprecedented. So yeah. what in your, how do we, what is next, right? Yeah. Do we, you know, do, do we essentially need to take GDP and increase GDP or if it reaches a certain level, do we all just like go get bunkers and you know, you know, shut off all the lights and just you know, or the gold, gold. <laughs> yeah, like gold. What, what, is, what is the the outcome, or what what should people do to prepare for? Uh, 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 I guess a a landscape where we have debt to GDP that high. 
So there are, you know, let's look at, we talked about three categories. Let's look at each one of them individually. Number one is countries that are borrowing money. So when countries that are borrowing money to meet the debt payment, so if you are borrowing money, interest rate is at an all time high. And uh, just like us, if you are borrowing money, we need to repay that. When uh, we are repaying, there is an estimated 100 countries or so, they are pretty um, um, low income countries. They have to reduce their spending on uh, essentials, right? Which is healthcare, education, uh, social security, uh, all the other uh, police force, etc. So they have to reduce the amount of spending that they are doing in, for that to increase the spending on uh, just debt servicing. So that increases the debt servicing level. Okay, what does it mean? If the countries are not able to service the debt, it's going to, if any one of the country default, like we saw what happened in Greece a couple of years ago, it will cause a panic in the financial markets with all these bonds that are outstanding. So that's number one. Number two, for businesses. Um, so if businesses, they cannot, they have borrowed a bunch of money. If they are not able to repay the debt, what's going to happen, right? They wouldn't have money to invest in hiring people, in jobs and expansion, so they have to let go of uh, of some of their customers, maybe even uh, bankruptcy for businesses that are not able to pay their loans. And uh, finally, for uh, individuals like people that have borrowed a loan, uh, borrowed money as a credit card or as a mortgage, the um, low income house households are mostly at risk, and uh, so that is the impact of it. And obviously, this is a like global macro picture. So many moving pieces. It's very difficult to predict what's going to happen. And there is not even agreement among economists. These you know people who have PhD that work at IMF. Um, not not all of the economists agree on uh, what how it's going to turn out. Um, so um, we have to curb inflation. So prices are increasing. And we are increasing the interest rate and interest rate increase in turn means higher loan repayment higher loan payment repayment might mean um you know all these insolvency and other things so multiple signals pointing to a recession at a global uh, level um, and based on what happened during the coronavirus uh, pandemic right we went on from uh, saying, hey, like, no, this is a pandemic to turning on the money printer right away. And the first time you do it, it's always challenging. Right. Like, now imagine the first time you are skydiving. Um, we don't know how the experience is going to be. So there is a lot of unknowns. But then once you have done that, right, the second time is like, OK, like, you know, you automatically thinking, OK, let us skydive. So the first time printing trillions of dollars uh, was a challenge and it went through. So future is going to become more and more easier. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's a it's a race between uh, how quickly people can print money and uh, how or how quickly governments can start printing money and uh, how much pain they, they can tolerate for repaying these uh, the their interest payments. Well, and I think, too, a, 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 an interesting framework, how I've seen or observed an interesting framework as it relates to this topic, VJ, is Ray Dalio. Ray Dalio talks about how there's MP1, Monetary Policy 1, Monetary Policy 2, and Monetary Policy 3. And these are the kind of a continuum that central banks and uh, governments use as a tool of, um, you know, oh, shit, oh, really shit, and then, oh, my God. Like we are like, that's the, that's the degree of concern. So you've got, you know, the manipulating of interest rates, which is monetary policy one, raising lower interest rates. So all of a sudden you have a little bit of a crisis, lower interest rates, move them all the way down to zero if you have to, right? That's monetary policy one. Monetary policy two is quantitative easing, which essentially you're, you're monetizing the bonds. Okay. So, so you can't lower the interest rates down any further. So we need a way to kind of grease the wheels even further let's just buy our own bonds print more money buy our own bonds get more money into circulation that's monetary policy number two and then you've got finally monetary policy number three which is the third arrow in the quiver which was used when covid to your point when covid came out or when we experienced covid which interest rates were already at zero they're already doing quantitative easing so now what 
okay, well, we're going to do CARES Act. We're going to just, we're literally going to just hand people money uh, through, you know, one trillion, two trillion dollars. What's a few trillion amongst friends? Um, but now we're starting to see the impact of that, right? So we're seeing the impact of that that um, degree of monetary policy intervention that we saw back in 2020. So it's kind of like the way I look at this is, okay, you know, you, you guzzle a Coke, right? Yeah, it tastes really good in the short term, right? Or you, you, you splurge on a Sunday. Yeah, it tastes really great, uh, you know, in the short term. But then the next day you wake up and you're like, oh, damn, I'm a little fatter. I got a little bit more around the, you know, got a little bit more around the thighs and around the, around the hips. And then you continue to do it again and you do it again and do it again. And before you know it, you're, you're a walking diabetic. Um, and maybe you're not walking so much after that, but the, that, that's what I think monetary policy is, is doing is that we are, we are getting to a point where we've lowered interest rates. Now, obviously we're, we've raised them back, thank God, but we, we've seen what it takes when you have decades of low monetary policy, then you've got, you know, quantitative easing, and then you've got fiscal policy, which is essentially just handing money to the, to, to ordinary Americans. That comes as a consequence. You get the sugar rush in the beginning, but later on the effects are felt. And I think that we're feeling the effects of that with high inflation and all that kind of stuff. So it's no surprise to me that we're seeing this with $307 trillion. And I just think that we're going to see, continue to see more of that. And we're going to continue to see more of monetary policy one, two, and three. So buckle up buttercups. <laughs> so uh, if anybody doesn't have any further to add on that topic, then we'll go into the thing that could actually save us. Right. We can enhance GDP by how everybody's talking about AI. Can we do it with AI? Uh, could Jack GPT's latest enhancement herald a revolutionary phase for crypto specifically? Um, a lot of people are saying so. So open a founder, Sam Altman, who we discussed on a previous podcast. Zoom in, Tom. Um, we can't read it. Oh, sorry. My bad, dude. Yeah. So uh, oh, is that better? Yeah. Much better. All right. Hold on, I don't know. What, okay, so OpenAI Sam, uh, OpenAI founder Sam Altman announced an enhancement for the company's power, popular AI power chatbot, ChatGPT, that could potentially revolutionize the crypto industry. We are so back, he says. ChatGPT can now browse the internet to provide you with current and authoritative information, complete with direct links to sources. It is no longer limited to data before September 2021. Well, I know you guys have been following this super closely. So what do you guys say about all this? Is it as revolutionary as this author purports? Does he have any case use cases in there or is he just saying uh, he's just up, to, up to date now, so therefore revolutionary for crypto? I think it's a I think it's a thesis. I don't think it's necessarily what did you say? let's see in June. Elliptic, a leading firm specializing in managing crypto risks, announced its integration of ChatGPT into its intelligence and research operations. This integration aims to enhance the efficiency and accuracy of Elliptic's research efforts, enabling investigator teams to identify emerging risk factors and manage larger volumes of risks effectively. Um, Solana Foundation integrated mm -hmm. ChatGPT into its network in May. Company introduced a new plugin that allows users to directly access features such as checking wallet balances, transferring tokens, and even purchasing NFTs and Solana through ChatGPT. Weird. Yeah, I think then, you know, perhaps it could be a good layer to pave the way for more tools within these platforms uh, that the consumers will be able to leverage and, uh, and the researchers will be able to leverage to help forecast a little bit better. That's what it seems like. So like right. BJ, what do you guys think? So the, I mean, obviously ChatGPT is being used in multiple, multiple businesses. And um, the, uh, uh, if it is most mostly for being able to predict adoption, um, you know, when ChatGPT doesn't have information, it just makes stuff up, right? If you tell ChatGPT, hey, like, no, remember the time when we went on a walk on the beach? Tell me more about it. It will tell you about the time when you walked on the beach with ChatGPT, even though that, that doesn't make any sense at all. It will just make up information uh, based on what uh, uh, what we provide. 
and uh, if we um, um, so if we say hey like no tell me what's going to happen next year um, it will tell something right it just makes information it, it's not that it it knows um, so i think people were asking about adoption for web3 and uh, and how to do research based on some of the tokens once you have internet access it just makes it easy for it to access real time information um, and uh, chat gpt is going to have an impact on every industry i don't know if it's something specific to the crypto industry um, that is uh, going to have an impact yeah you know garbage in garbage out right so as long as these researchers are aware that chat gpt can make stuff up then uh then hopefully they still like use their heads to 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 make these forecasts and make these predictions uh but i think even more you know as it alluded with the solana how solana is using it they're they're going to be using it to help pull up data to help to help just kind of increase efficiencies in many different ways uh so that is that revolutionary like you said uh, every business is doing this uh so it's going to be interesting to see how it evolves Agreed, agreed. Well, next topic, it, and this is just in, guys. <laughs> As said right here, critical Bitcoin warning from IMF to El Salvador. Will Bitcoin's official currency status change? The IMF has reiterated its stance on crypto, stating that it's a well-established fact, well in quotes, that the agency does not support the use of Bitcoin as legal tender, no doubt. This statement comes amid ongoing talks with El Salvador, which adopted Bitcoin as its official currency a couple of years, I think it was two or three years ago. IMF emphasized that Bitcoin structural measures should be impl implemented in El Salvador. Although the details of these measures have not been disclosed, they are likely to involve significant changes in the country's financial and economic policies. In adding to these concerns, IMF is negotiating a new financing agreement with El Salvador, the latest negotiation mission to the country was described as a very productive step, but both sides acknowledge that they were not there yet in reaching agreement. According to Rodrigo Valdez, director of the IMS Western Hemisphere Department, told Reuters, our solution, our relations with El Salvador have been very productive. We only had one mission there, a negotiating mission, but we knew it would be a first step. So what is a, what say you, all you folk on this one? There was, uh, I think earlier this year, they blocked uh, El Salvador, the government uh, blocked the IMF from releasing the report. Um, and uh, because uh, they had like a loan of about $800 million and uh, um, they were, the there was a report that wrongly mentioned about there is the looming deadline and with the implosion of cryptocurrency market El Salvador may not be able to pay the loan um, and uh, um, then they had like a whole press event uh, but bottom line is that um, the initial report that IMF made was blocked and was never released um, and then uh, so now I guess the IMF is uh, going to uh, they sent a team to el salvador to uh, do some on the ground investigating uh, reporting to figure out what's happening in the country yeah so one one thing that is a common misunderstanding on el salvador is not that bitcoin is legal in the salvador for to do payments it's actually mandatory so if you want to go to a drugstore and buy a packet of cigarettes the person selling you that they must accept Bitcoin. That's what exactly it means, right? It's not that it's you can you can use it if you want. Is that you you have the right for everyone to accept you Bitcoin at any time for any transaction for any amount, and that I created a lot of problems because there are use cases that should not be like contemplated using Bitcoin, especially for transactions that are like such low money. Uh, that's why, like in El Salvador, the Lightning Network it thrives because. For those problems, they are the perfect solution when it's like mandatory by the state to accept them. So just wanted to add that. Yeah, they had a wallet, right? They had like their own uh, wallet to be used Cold. to Chivo. Chivo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the IMF also did uh, an audit for the wallet um, 
to see to make sure that there is no um, backdoor or anything like that, right? Where people think that they're depositing the money and somebody else uh, um, kind of swindles it at the back end. Um, and uh, I don't know what came out of the audit. Gotcha. Uh, well, one more one more topic before we finish up, guys, and I think that's the Master Mo Mastercard announces successful wrapped CBDC trial results. Hopefully, uh, I prefer not to see the word successful and uh, CBDC. And CBDC on the same sentence. <laughs> But uh, that's just me. The experiment demonstrated that CBDCs could be wrapped to purchase NFTs on blockchains such as Ethereum. Uh, so it looks like MasterCard has completed a trial involving wrapping central bank digital currencies on different blockchains, similar to, say, a wrapped Bitcoin or a wrapped ETH that most people that are familiar with that. According to October 12th announcement, the trial was conducted with the Reserve Bank of Australia and country's digital reserve, digital, sorry, digital finance cooperative research center, CBDC, along with participation from Cuscal and Mintable. In a live environment, MasterCard said the solution allowed a CBDC owner to purchase a non-fungible token listed on Ethereum in a live environment. Uh, the process locked the required amount of pilot CBDC on the RBA's pilot CBDC platform and minted an equivalent amount of wrapped pilot CBDC tokens on Ethereum, the payment processor wrote. Interesting. All right. Well, looks like they've established that they, you know, can that it's at least operable, at least with one transaction. So what do you guys think about this? It's a positive news, but it's not, I don't think it's quite significant. So when we think of CBDCs, like, um, maybe we have a vision that you know like some like three of them are being tried right now and china is doing the big one and russia also the big one but there are like hundreds of experiments of on on cbdc's not only done by countries but also done by international organizations organizations such as swift for example uh payment providers such as mastercard and visa and i'm sure many other ones that i'm not mentioning so it's like I think we really need to see like what were they testing for, right? Because everyone knows that it's technically feasible to do a CBDC, right? Like it's it's just another stable coin, if you think about it, that runs on a private blockchain. But what does it actually mean? Um, I'm still not quite sure. Um, I, I'm not sure like MasterCard is also like, like quite sure. I do think that when the CBDCs like started to be more popular, like, like, the, 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 the discourse of them like two years ago, like everyone was doing a trial of them. Not exactly sure what's the end purpose of them. If at the end, like CBDCs are, are controlled by the state, right? To me, I think that the di distinguishing feature, uh, Mariano, is that, okay, so you've got permissioned blockchains or you got permissionless blockchains, right? So a permissioned blockchain would be like, you know, what they're, what they're testing with these CBDCs. I think the other distinguishing feature is that you, you're required to use it by the state, right, in transactions. So just like Bitcoin, you are required to accept Bitcoin in El Salvador, in other countries through a CBDC, you're going to be required to transact on that CBDC network. Um, the difference between, obviously, you know, Bitcoin and Ethereum is that nobody on Bitcoin and Ethereum is requiring us to use that currency. Right. We use that currency because we choose to use that currency. But with the CBDC, they're going to, um, what is the word, de not de facto, but they're going to they're gonna essentially require you that you have to use it. It's compulsory. It's, it's uh, you know, if you're going to buy the pack of chewing gum, you have to do it uh, on the CBDC network, on the FedNow network or whatever it is. So I think that that is a, the distinguishing feature of what, makes a CBDC a CBDC versus just a permissionless network that, that we choose to use like Bitcoin or Ethereum. Yeah, so this article talks more about uh, doing from one chain to another, which has been happening for a while, right? If you if you look at it, there is WBC wrapped Bitcoin and uh, Bitcoin is a separate network and wrapped Bitcoin is issued, say, on Ethereum network. So what happens is that you have these... Uh, um, uh, validator nodes where you can go and deposit your Bitcoin and then you will get WBTC in return on Ethereum. 
there are other chains where you can do that, um, where you can go deposit, say, um, uh, you know, uh, USDC in uh, one network in Ethereum and receive USDC in another uh, network like uh, um, Optimism or Arbitrum or any of the other uh, networks, right? So that's already been happening, but this all crypto to crypto kind of wrap transaction here, what they have done is they have uh, used a, a bank, right? You are depositing money into a bank and then being able to mint out a wrapped uh, USDC equivalent on the other, other end. So that is the main experiment. It's not a big technical achievement because that has been happening in so many other uh, chains. However, the whole question of then who are the people who are permitted to mint these tokens? Uh, that's what's happening with the case of Tether. Tether can print these tokens because uh, they control uh, how these tokens are being minted and the rules around how the tokens are minted, it's not very clear. There are certain approved uh, or, or permissioned uh, validators like what Dominic was saying, who can mint all these Tether tokens. Um, so doing the cross chain transaction, good, you know, not a big, a huge technical achievement. CBDCs are inevitable. It is going to happen whether people like it or not. Um, you know, it is going to happen. And uh, this is about depositing on one network and being able to mint the equivalent amount of CBDC in another network and using that to be able to buy um, uh, an NFT, right? So that's the technical process that happened in this particular case. Got that, BJ. Thank you for that explanation. Uh, Michael, Mariano, do you have any comments on this in particular? Um, not in particular. All right. How about some closing remarks? It is time for closing remarks. And by the way, everybody, be sure to like, subscribe, give us some comments. Come on. Feedback is welcome. Um, so bring, bring it our way. Uh, but closing remarks. Who wants to go first? <laughs> not all at the same time Don't there is no what a there great no, yeah there is no amount of uh, there is no lack of uh, um, entertainment in the crypto space you know join crypto there is uh, um, so much drama there if you are interested in uh, in a good uh, a thriller story <laughs> it's got <laughs> it's got yeah. some great stories going on right now Never if you want to dabble, in, no shortage of opportunity <laughs> at the same time, right? Yeah. And talking about opportunity, if you want to double your money and risk free, come to Argentina. <laughs> <laughs> Guaranteed. <laughs> Guaranteed. 